Well, I'm really happy now to be joined by Dr. Joseph Lamellis, and uh, Joe is from Miami, Correct. Um, Chief of Cardiac Surgery at Mount Sinai in Miami, so thanks very much for joining me. Thank you, it's a pleasure. I, I told you I'm a native of Miami, so I feel at least we can we can talk we can talk uh, Miami ease or something. You can relate. Yeah, yeah relate right, for sure. So, Joe, tell me how, you know, if people, you've been very successful in multiple hospitals in South Florida and setting up very active valve programs. How should somebody go about setting up a mitral valve program? Right, well, first, I think that it's important for the surgeon to have a good uh, fundamental knowledge of valve surgery, and especially since we're talking about the mitral valve, right. different mitral valve repair techniques. Okay. I think the surgeon cannot limit himself to one specific technique. I think he has to have a toolbox of techniques because not every mitral valve is created equally, sure. as we know. So sure. you have to have different options and even different bailout options for that matter. So I think the surgeon has to be very well versed in valve replacement and repair techniques, okay. Okay. which is very important. Okay, so so you have to build up that experience, is that right. correct? I think you need to realize that, that mitral valve surgery is going to be shared in the future by both cardiologists and surgeons, but it's going to still maintain in the domain of the cardiac surgeon. So you, you still have to go to conferences like this, stay up to date, acquire new techniques, and, and obviously apply those techniques to your practice and to your patients. Tremendous talk now about the team approach to and you know, you, you and I were just mentioning it. And so if part of your mitral program or your valve program would be your cardiologist or your you know, intensivist, is that correct? Exactly, I think it, it's a collaborative effort between the cardiac surgeon, the cardiologist, the echocardiographer, the department, which could be a cardiologist or an anesthesiologist, sure. and also the, the, the intensivist as well, and the internal medicine doctor, because I think that, that as we know there are many patients who have symptomatic MR and even asymptomatic MR that are candidates for surgery who never reach the operating room, never even offered an option for surgery. So I think that the surgeon and the cardiologist who are very involved in, in mitral valve surgery and, and repair techniques and, and treating patients with mitral valve disease should educate others and, and, and make their patients aware that there are significant long-term benefits from a symptomatic standpoint and from a survival standpoint if they go to surgery earlier as, a, as opposed to waiting. No, you're, you're absolutely right. So so the $64,000 question is how do you educate? So how do you educate the interns? Because we were mentioning David Box paper, show that or how, and, and then how do we educate the consumer over appropriate timing? Right. I think you know the majority of the consumers get their information either from the internet or TV. And, and the newspaper. So I think those, I think the older patients are educated through the newspaper and the younger ones through the internet and TV and, and both as well. So I think getting the message out to patients, I mean, I think that's really the, the main way that, that you could get that message across. As far as to your, to your doctors, it would obviously be through courses, symposiums, newsletters. I think that's probably the, the most effective way. You, 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 you mentioned something very important because I was talking to Tyrone earlier about and the concept that I think historically we've waited way too long in these patients, even asymptomatic with quotes normal LV function. You know, they might have elevated left atrial pressures, big atrium, they might have elevated PA pressures at rest or with exercise. We really shouldn't wait for people to get to that level, should we? We should. I think the I think the you obviously have to have a surgical team that's able to repair valves. And I think this, the cardiologist will be more prone to sending these patients early to surgery. So there may be a little bit of, of hesitation because of that, but but if this, the surgeon has these uh, these techniques in, in the armamentarium, I think that, that more more patients would benefit from early intervention. And you, you were mentioning also that you have multiple approaches to the valve, valve repair. Um, Correct. I, I actually, have launched a very successful minimal invasive practice, and I perform 600 valve procedures a year, and 500 of those are minimal invasive procedures. And and I do isolated mitrals with concomitant maze procedures, mitral tricuspids, aortic mitrals. So I, I, there's a, a tremendous um, uh, number of variations of techniques going to be applied through this mini thoracotomy approach. And in addition to that. You know, what, what I have seen in my practice is that that's driven more patients to me. Obviously, we know sure. that 
The majority of minimally invasive operations are applied to the low risk asymptomatic patient or I'll take them to the low risk patient. Yeah. But what's nice about this is especially young patients who are reluctant to have a sternotomy, right. they will accept a minimally invasive approach because psychologically they feel that they've not had surgery, which right. obviously is not the case, but, yeah. but at least they feel that way and they're more uh, uh, accepting to undergo surgery. So, so just going back to where we began with a very successful valve program, then obviously you have to have a, a, a successful surgeon like yourself, somebody who's trained, innovating, creating this, but then you need to surround yourself with good colleagues that can support you and then right. begin the process of educating both the referral physicians and the consumer? Correct. I think another thing that, that's important is, is to have a, a good uh, a cardiology team that, that knows how to interpret echocardiograms. And I think that a lot of uh, programs around the country are, you know, they, they, they have people that actually review the echoes and a red flag comes up when they see a patient with severe mitral regurgitation and they will alert either the internist or the cardiologist that something should be done or at least you know somebody else should evaluate the patient and make a, a decision. One thing I wanted to mention which uh, I think that, that talking about the minimally invasive approach which I think is important as well sure. is that these with this operation I've been able to apply it to the high risk patient meaning the elderly over 75 the patients who are obese with BMIs of over 30, patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and patients who, who in many cases, would not, are not good candidates for sternotomies. I think even the patients with low ejection fractions, these are the patients that I've seen have benefit, benefit more from a, a, a non-sternal sure. splitting sure. operation. That's cool. Listen, it, you've certainly had a, have set up an impressive program, and I think you've given the viewers a good idea about how they go about it. Thanks very much for visiting. I appreciate us. it. Thank it's you. Good for your to time. meet you, Joe. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Thank okay. you.